Welcome to the Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. Today's topic is Transcranial Photobiomodulation and Parkinson's Disease. Now, Transcranial Photobiomodulation has a very good evidence-based alternative non-invasive solution with important therapeutic results for these intractable neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's disease. This is especially important due to the inability of pharmacological agents to assist people with these wide range of neurodegenerative problems. I'd like to introduce Professor Laxo. She's an executive committee member of the Australian Medical Laser Association and past president of the World Association of Laser Therapy. She's an honorary associate professor and senior research fellow, Allied Health at the Mater Medical Research Institute in Brisbane. And she's a professor of physiotherapy in the School of Allied Health Sciences at Griffith University, Gold Coast, on the East Coast of Australia. And uh, one of the things is that in the early 90s, uh, Lisa was the first person in Australia to complete a PhD investigating photobiomodulation. And tonight she joins us after, that's 30 years of research. And uh, you've turned the light onto neurodegenerative conditions. Tell me how you got started with that. Well, Joe, I think one of the things that you need to understand is that my photobiomodulation research has covered the full gamut um, from investigating the effect of light on cell culture studies of normal and malignant cells uh, through to animal studies of the effect of therapy in acute and chronic inflammation. Uh, to clinical studies of mechanisms and, and clinical outcomes in, in people with pain, inflammation, with uh, neurodegenerative conditions and, and tissue healing. Um, and, I, and I've been honoured to work with a number of collaborators, um, research students and, and uh, colleagues here in Australia and, and internationally. The thing with all of this activity is that I've developed a bit of a reputation here in Australia for doing things outside of the norm um, and I was contacted by a clinical uh, colleague in physiotherapy who had read Norman Dodge's book and was interested in looking at how she might use PBM in a range of conditions in her practice and one of those was headache, migraine and another one was Parkinson's disease and so that's kind of how I got started uh, in looking at um, transcranial PBM. We started to look at what the evidence was in relation to transcranial PBM in other conditions, Margaret Nays's work in particular, uh, in the case studies she's published, and then a chat with a, a research, clinical research colleague in Sydney, and Dr. Anne Liebert, and we started to to talk about what the possibilities might be. In the end, my colleague, Dr. Joanne Bullock-Saxton, who was the person who originally contacted me, said she'd like to do some research, some clinical research, and she was able to get funding from a couple of philanthropic bodies. And so we then advanced to designing a protocol, um, a placebo-controlled um, pilot trial, looking at what we thought were reasonable parameter for treatment in this patient group. So that's that's where I got started. And when did you, you trained as a, your training was a, you got a PhD, but what was your undergraduate? What did you do before that type of thing? How did you get to? I'm, I'm a physiotherapist. I'm a registered physiotherapist or, or physical therapist as it's known in some parts of the world. And so you went from the, the, clinic, you know, learning to work on people and taking care of people with their pain problems and their associated problems, all the way to the lab where you worked on cells, and then all the way back out to working on patients again, right? Yeah, and I think that's a really valuable model to follow because you can, can test parameters and the wide range of parameters that we have in PBM in bench top studies and in animal studies and then translate those findings into the more expensive clinical models. So I, I like to move between each of those, those areas. 
Now that big push I mean, to the to the public that doesn't really know this that there is a there is a national push in Australia to try to get a little bit of a better understanding and get ahead of these tsunami of neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and, and dementia. Uh, and you guys are, this is a public health movement and you guys are way ahead of the curve as far as a continent uh, to actually take care of this. So how long was it did, ago did you start this kind of diving into this? Because you're already up to getting preliminary results of this pilot study. So give us some background in how quickly you guys moved to to start to investigate this. Yeah, look, I think it was about 2016 when my colleague Joanne Bullock Saxton um, rang me, and and um, I met her, and we sat down and had a bit of a chat, and I showed her what devices are, and and um, you know we we looked at a bit more of the research papers, the published research, and then. Um, through 2017, we met with um, Anne Liebert in Sydney and she introduced, introduced us to some of the people at the University of Sydney who were, who've been doing the animal work using light um, and applying that to rodent models and to monkey models and demonstrating that interventional application of light to the brain and also transcutaneous application of light to the brain and to remote areas like the abdomen, the tummy, um, could have an effect on what they did was induce um, Parkinson's disease in, in, their, in their animals. So they, they kind of made a, an artificial kind of Parkinson's in, in these animals. And they showed that there was really good results. Um, and then so those people were, were Dan Johnston and John Mitrofanis and Professor Jonathan Stone at, at the University of Sydney. Um, John Mitrofanis had been talking with uh, Catherine Hamilton, Dr Catherine Hamilton, a general practitioner in Tasmania, who'd been making buckets with LEDs in them and um, giving those to her patients with Parkinson's disease and finding that they were getting great results with daily application of these LED buckets. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of pulled us all together, all of that kind of networking pulled us all together and we started to talk about, well, how can we translate that into, into good, rigorous clinical studies? And, and so then um, Anne and I in particular and, and Joanne, well, look, Saxton, we, we started to talk about, well, let's put together a protocol and let's get it through ethics. And so we did that. I did that at my old um, workplace at Griffith Uni and uh, we got the ethics proposal um, approved. And that proposal has morphed into a pilot study, a randomised controlled pilot study here in Brisbane. And two further proof of concept studies, one in Adelaide and one in Sydney. And we did different things in each of those studies. In the Brisbane study, we applied the light to the, to the head. In the Adelaide study, we applied the light to the head and the abdomen um, and the spine, the neck. And in the Sydney study, the light was applied only to the abdomen because we wanted to test whether there was something happening at the local um, application site and whether you could translate some of the mouse studies which had found that by applying light to the, the stomach area, the abdominal area of the mice, you can also get a, a remote effect. Um, probably, and we think either through the microbiome or the or the, the gut-brain axis. axis. Um, so that, that was our thinking. I like it, and I think you've covered it. And, and you know, you were really a, right there because of the connection with the scientists, and that, because you were close enough to kind of spread the word, and the rest of us kind of have to wait for a conference to come along to really get the particulars of this. So that, that I want to, you know, you know, again, 
say how far ahead Australia is in this, and they've already got studies going, and they've got people and ground works, and you know how many universities there are working at it. So I think that that's very positive. Okay, so I, I think the other interesting thing out of all of this is that we've been able to interest the neurologists, the doctors, the um, movement disorders specialists around the possibility that this could be a, a non-interventional, non-pharmacological way of helping people with Parkinson's disease to manage their symptoms and signs. That's a great push. That's a great push. Because... You know, you picked one of the most difficult neurodegenerative diseases because there's physical manifestations, not just, you know, like in a dementia, there's just a memory and maybe quality of life movements and things like that. But you went after something very, very strong, which is the motor component uh, that is also included in this. So it's not, it's, it's like... A, a bigger, a bigger situation, and you went right at that. And there's, there's not all. So I said that's a very big thing. So, to, you know, let's take a look at some of the slides now and see what, you know, how you kind of address this. Yeah, sure. Let me, um, let me bring this up on the screen, and I'll share it with you. Hopefully. Can you see that? No, you have. You should hit the button that says "then share the screen." The the one. Okay. That I thought I had done that. There we go. Okay, there we go. Let's see if it goes. All right. So that's me, and this is the collaborators that I worked with on this particular study. Um, which was a, a, a double-blinded placebo-controlled pilot study. And my, my colleagues here, Anne Bullock-Saxton, who's a physiotherapist with her PhD as well, and she works clinically, um, but, ha but continues to, to do research. And Dr. Alex Lynn is a neurologist, a, a movement disorder specialist, and he helped us with the uh, recruitment of our patients through the Princess Alexandra Hospital um, the site of the work was the Active Rehabilitation Physiotherapy Clinic in Brisbane. And we were fortunate that we had some financial contributions to doing this particular study and, and, and those um, sponsors are, are listed there. Okay, so we know, as you've mentioned, Joe, that um, Parkinson's disease is a pretty common but also progressive disorder and it has both motor um, symptoms, associated, motor signs, I should say, uh, associated with it and non-motor symptoms. So things like tremor and slow, slowness of movement and, and issues related to mood and anxiety and sleep disturbances and, and those kinds of things. It's not a curable condition. Um, in, in fact, it, it will progress. Um, and unfortunately, there's no known cause for it. It's, a, it's an uncertain etiology and one of the hypotheses, one of the, one of the um, causes that people think is associated with Parkinson's is that um, it comes from mitochondria of the cells of the body um, and if there's not enough energy being uh, delivered by the cells of the body then, then that can cause some um, problem with uh, all kinds of moves in the body. Now, photobiomodulation therapy is proposed to stimulate mitochondrial activity. And so we thought, well, here's an opportunity to do that in a really meaningful way in a clinical setting. So 
so our question was, could photobiomodulation therapy influence the, the non-motor and, and motor effects in Parkinson's disease, at least in the short term? And so we measured a whole range of different non-motor and motor outcomes. And we measured before and after four weeks of PBM therapy. Well, in some patients, they received a sham PBM therapy. So um, it, it, to all intents and purposes, the device looked like a functioning PBM device, but it, it actually wasn't functioning. And we did the assessments each morning before the, the participants had their Parkinson's disease medications um, in what's known as the off period, when their symptoms and signs may be at their worst. We tested both adults and female, uh, sorry, uh, both females and males, adults, um, and they'd been diagnosed by Alex Len um, with idiopathic Parkinson's disease in either stage one through to three. And that diagnosis was made during their on period, so when, when their drugs were having their, their most effect. And they had to have had more than three weeks of stable anti-Parkinson's disease medication. So they, need, they um, couldn't have been at that early stage of induction into their pharmacological treatment. Um, otherwise, that might have interfered with our results. Excellent. We had a range of exclusion criteria, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of those, but of course, this study was uh, approved from a uh, human research ethics committee, and so all of the exclusion criteria and inclusion criteria were assessed to ensure that none of the participants were put at risk from what we proposed to do in the study. We recruited, as I mentioned before, through Dr. Len's Specialist Movement Disorders Clinic at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Um, and he basically told the participants about the study and, and if, the, if any of his patients showed any interest, um, then he would provide those patients with the contact number of one of the research team, and, and that was Joanne Bullock-Saxton. And she then contacted the participants, explained the project and the time burdens and, and sent those, those patients a participant information and consent form, which was then signed um, uh, as per due process. We had 20 volunteers who signed up very quickly, and they were randomly allocated into a treatment or a sham group. Uh, and the people who were involved in this were the participants themselves, obviously patients with Parkinson's disease, physiotherapists who actually did the treat. They were blinded to what they were giving, what kind of treatment, whether it was the, the light therapy or, or the sham therapy. And we also had examiners, uh, both physiotherapists and nurses, who were blind to the allocation. And the nurses were involved in doing the um, UPDRS, which is the gold standard assessment for Parkinson's disease. And you can see there the numbers that were in each group and um, the, the gender split, the age, uh, all of them were right hand dominant. And you can see where, where the participants, symptoms and signs predominantly affected them either on the right or the left or both sides. So the groups were fairly similar in relation to their age um, and also to the severity of their Parkinson's disease. The protocol involved three treatments per week of either the active intervention, the active laser therapy, uh, or the sham laser therapy. And the treatment was done as much as possible at the same time of day for all of the participants. And this slide summarises what that treatment looked like. We haven't yet published this work, so you'll see that um, the, the slides that I'm showing are, are confidential as far as this virtual summit goes. So, you know, we're hoping that people who are viewing this understand 
understand that and, and don't use this data um, uh, indiscriminately. But we used an infrared wavelength of, of laser and you can see the power output there was 60 milliwatts. The frequency of the pulsing was 50 hertz and we treated for 33 seconds or the equivalent of two joules per point underneath each of the diodes. And so in total, when you look at all of those treatment points on the diagrams there, we treated 21 points. Those were standardised points and the participants came three times a week for that treatment for four weeks. The sham treatment was exactly the same. The, the device uh, had the same kind of audible and visual signals that the treatment device did, but there was no output. Can I make a, one point here just to clarify? If I'm not mistaken, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, the 21 standardized points are the four diodes, if you will, placed in five different locations, that's 20, plus the one which was intraoral, which is 21, correct? That's correct. That's and that intraoral one was specifically chosen because we wanted to get light as close as possible to the substantia nigra um, of the brain. And so we devised a protocol that would hopefully do that um, a bit more efficiently or effectively than the transcranial positions that you see there. Now, Lisa, may I, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, but is this the first time that an external palatal uh, activation was used in a study? I mean, you as far as we know, that's the case. I agree. So I say this was... And the biggest question at the outset was like, wow, how is this going to really work getting deep brain structures? Because we haven't really, you know, we don't have a lot of the data yet on deep brain structures. And here you answered it with your intervention. Again, the same, the same thing was the 60, it was the same uh, uh, nanometers and uh, milliwatts and everything like that. It was just a, an intraoral place. So I think that's wonderful and fabulous and a great insight. Well done. That's all. Thank you. We then had to decide on what measures we would use and, and because there had been so little work done in this space, we decided on a suite of different outcome measures and you can see them listed there. I don't have time to go all through, through all the data today, but um, there's a few that I'm going to concentrate on and they're the motor tests. So we did upper limb and, and lower limb um, motor testing, so the nine hole peg test, um, which is a measure of finger dexterity, and the, the spiral writing test, which is following a template. Um, and then we also looked at the step test, the dynamic balance test, and a timed up and go test of, of mobility, functional mobility. This is timed up and go test looks like, it's, it's getting up uh, it's timing the, the time it takes for a person to get up from a chair, walk three metres, turn around and sit down again. And the step test is done on both the left and the right side. And it's the number of steps that a person can uh, take moving the foot, either the left or the right foot in turn, moving the foot onto a step and back down again. So the number of times that that's done in 15 seconds. And that tests balance. Quite elegant. A number of, uh, the quite elegant uh, essay that you did. Again, when you said a suite, I think that's quite elegant because you looked at both upper extremity and lower extremity movement and dexterity. And this is what we find. This is what happens with people with Parkinson's. So you did a great job on that. Yeah, and I guess if we've got a few minutes, Joe, um, after this, I, I'm happy to talk about the non-motor symptoms as well as we've seen some effects on those in the other studies um, done in the other centres in Australia. So we did a number of statistical analyses and 
um, I, I don't want to give everything away because we haven't published this, but, but what I do want to stress here is that it, this was a pilot study and the intent of the pilot study was to understand things like feasibility and tolerability and acceptability of doing this in a larger randomised controlled trial, but also to look at uh, safety and efficacy. And so what I'm showing you here is, is efficacy results in small numbers. And the results are pretty good, even though they didn't reach statistical significance. And um, as an example, if we, if we look at the spiral test, after four weeks, uh, you'll notice I've highlighted in yellow that the mean time taken to do the spiral test was 10.4 seconds compared to 35 seconds in the um, baseline before the treatment began. So that's a significant improvement in time for upper limb dexterity or, or, or for writing if you like. In the nine hole peg test, on the left hand side, what we've got there is, is two sets of data which demonstrate the, the sham treatment, both before the four week commencement of the treatment and at the end of the four weeks of treatment. And then the two right hand sets of data um, is the treatment group at, which receives three times a week of active treatment. And you can see from that, um, this is this is the spiral test um, to start with. Uh, there was a you know a, a pretty convincing reduction in time there that we've already mentioned. So a reduction in those bar graphs is a faster completion. Um, I'm sorry. In the um, in the nine hole peg test, we didn't see that. That's the red coloured bars there. We didn't see as great a um, reduction, but there was a slight reduction. Um, and for the nine-hole peg test, the on the non-dominant hand, there, there was really very little difference. So the main thing there was the spiral, spiral test. In the functional mobility test, the timed up and go test, again on the on the left hand side we've got the pre and post sham outcomes, not a great deal of difference in the time it took for patients or participants to uh, take to do that, that little uh, mobility test. But in the group that received the active treatment, there was quite a marked reduction in the time that it took these, these patients or these participants to, to do that three, three metre walk and sitting up and down from around about 11 and a half seconds to just over 10 seconds. Um, so we, we started to feel as though probably something was happening there. And then when we looked at the dynamic balance test, on the left here again, we've got the sham treat, treated group um, for at the pre four week treatment phase, the pre sham and then the post sham. And there was really not much difference in either the right or left sided step test. But with the active treatment group, there was an increase in the number of steps that these participants were able to do. Again, I'll stress that these are not statistically significant results, but we're starting to see something that suggests that um, maybe there is an active effect of PBM. So, our conclusion was that there is a placebo effect apparent with the sham treatment and that photobiomodulation therapy did influence or appeared to influence some aspects of upper and lower limb motor function in the way that we tested in this four week treatment program. We wondered whether um, if, we if we had treated for longer, whether that might have improved that effect. The changes didn't translate into statistically significant differences, although they, they may become clinically important. But what was helpful about this pilot study was that it helped us to understand 
what we need to do about going forwards into a, a larger randomised controlled trial and what kind of sensitivity of these measures is important to consider before we go on to do a bigger study with a longer treatment time frame uh, with greater participant numbers and to try and understand if there's a threshold of, of dose that's required to elicit a substantial change. So before we go on, Joe, I just want to recognise the, the team that was involved here. Um, most of these people are clinicians and so for them to be involved in a clinical research study, you know, it, it added burden um, but it actually demonstrated to them how important this kind of work can be for a pretty intractable and progressive neurodegenerative problem such as Parkinson's disease. Well, that's a dedicated staff, uh, dedicated people, and uh, being a clinical researcher, I can tell you that that's, uh, it takes a village, and you've done an amazing, amazing job. Uh, quite elegant. Um, if you could, uh, uh, you know, in a, when you're doing a pilot study, most of the time, we just want to see a signal. And you don't really, you know, from what I used to do, we don't really look at statistical significance. We look at descriptive, and then we try to power it. Because, we, you know, there's not enough, 10 people is, is only enough to, to see, get, a, get a ripple, a signal. And we definitely saw a signal in there. So um, you, you wonder, how, you know, there's just so many ways to go with this. Because, again, great research brings up more great questions. Uh, and I don't know how we're doing for time because I'm not paying attention because it's up to us to do as until we feel like we've talked it out, you know. But uh, talk about some of the other things. I mean, did you do you did the subjective analysis on people and the so the caregivers were observing them, if I'm not mistaken, in some of those questionnaires. That's right. We we did the UPDRS, both the patient version and the carer version. Um, we also did some quality, in addition to that, I'm pretty sure we did a quality of life measure. The quality of life and, and things like cognitive improvement was something that the patients, the participants themselves were able to notice and not necessarily just in this, in this Brisbane um, study, in the proof of concept studies that we've been running in Adelaide and Sydney. The carers um, were really important in helping us to identify that there were other things that were improving with these patients. Um, things like concentration span, um, things that didn't necessarily become obvious to the participants themselves, but other observers could see that there were things going on. Um, you know, we had people whose sleep was improved significantly. One fellow who, and Liebert reports that um, hadn't been able to sleep in years and years. And after his treatment began, he was sleeping seven or eight a night. So, you know, those are important or participant reported experience and outcome measures that are, are not necessarily um, evaluated or assessed in many studies. And, and when we, as we're, as we're devising, as we're setting up the protocol for, for an RCT, for randomised clinically controlled trial with, with adequate participant numbers, we're looking at, at including things like measures of cognition, measures of social cognition, um, and other, other symptoms that aren't necessarily um, picked up on um, motor, motor assessments. When I, you know, it just my observation in looking at this, and I can say an elegant study, is that, you know, when you treat a disease, you look for a disease outcome. But when you treat the brain, the brain is going to change everything. So I, I can just imagine, because that's a real big battery of tests you put people through. But the point is you caught, you captured a lot of the rain that came out of it. So that's why I think I salute you because I, I have a con, you know a pretty good concept of what what in, it entailed uh, for these people what the patients endured so we want to thank them and also to the to the clinicians and the research assistants who, who did those studies because you picked up signals uh, in this small pilot study that 
are, are, will inform the future and make people understand this because you know it, we are taking care of the brain and the brain is making these changes. And I, but I, you know that's that's like the that's like more of the that's like the whipped cream on the icing on the cake. But the thing that really struck me is that really a minimal amount of applications for a minimal amount of time, really, created ability of these people, both in the upper extremity and the lower extremity, to have freedom of movement. So for someone to be able to get up and walk in a more rapid pace is, 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 is really, what that's what you're trying to do. You know, so you, it's a very, very good signal. You know, you got a blip and, and that's why I think it was a, a, an excellent, an excellent, an excellent research study. Thank you for sharing it. And we're the first world premiere. So I like that. <laughs> well, as I said before, we, we're looking to publish this work, but we've also got to think about this in, in relation to all of the other methodologies, designs that we've been using in the proof of concept studies. Um, to, to work out what are going to be the most sensitive outcome measures, what is the best way to apply this. And to some degree we have to think about the ethics, the clinical ethics around applying this and then withdrawing it from people actually getting benefit from it. Um, and that was, that's been one of the biggest challenges for us um, and, and is something that we've got to come to grips with going forward. Well, I think that that's a big, that's, that seems to be a major issue, not only in the clinic, but also in the, in the clinical studies, but also in the clinic when, you know, patients want it more, you know, if I could do this for, you know, three times a week, what happens if I did it every day? What happens if I did it twice a day? And these are things that, you know, our people are attempting and trying as we get into the more you know, the clinical setting, that's that's what people are going to try to do, and maybe we can come up with a way to monitor them as we work through that. So. And and you've raised a good point, Joe, that, you know, the, the number of times of treatment is, is, is important. We found that um, in other parts of our work that one or twi once or twice a week is not enough. Three times a week seems to be hitting the sweet spot um, because when we have tried in... in case series, um, more than that doesn't seem to have an effect or, or may in fact be too much for the brain. We have to establish that in a, in a, a properly controlled trial, but that's what we're starting to see. I know. I, I, okay. I, I found this on the web for case series more than that doesn't seem like it done me too much. Sorry, Joe. That's okay. Siri decided to respond to the question. Uh, but Siri knows everything. So, uh, and I think that that's a, that's that we're probably going to get questions about <laughs> as we move forward. That you know, uh, we're just doing what we can do, all of us. And I think I want to again salute you and your group. Thank you for coming on board. What would you say to how do I want to say this to the to the people out there? that what do you think uh, the future holds for this type of therapy? Since you are kind of, I kind of say like Galileo looking through the telescope, uh, what would you inform other people as to what you're seeing? And I've sort of brought it down, but what would you say you're seeing? Look, I think the future looks bright, if you'll pardon the pun. I mean, we're talking about light therapy here. My, my personal experience with transcranial PBM convinces me that it'll, it'll eventually demonstrate high levels of evidence that will convince mainstream medicine that there is another way, um, an, another method to add to the kit bag um, that's not interventional, that's, that's not pharmacological, and we know that those things have side effects. Um, I, I think we still have to do some work around uh, the safety and tolerability around trans PBM. I think there are some things there that still have to be answered around 
what the common effects are, not necessarily side effects so much as effects that might be amplified in people who have already, for example, got dysautonomia um, in Parkinson's disease. My original PhD work looked at the um, uh, the, the, the I'm, I'm having a, a brain block here. Um, you did the lymphedema. Yeah, uh, it'll come back to me in a minute, Joe. Um, my original PhD work looked at the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the way that stress and pain uh, relate to each other. And we know that that HPA axis is involved with uh, the autonomic nervous system. If PBM has a direct effect on that axis, then could we potentially make people who've got autonomic symptoms, could we potentially make them worse? So we need to understand those kinds of things and that needs to be in the context of things like dose and, and how often people get treated. So we, we need to be a bit careful about how we do this and we need to do the right kind of evidence um, in, in a progressive way from preclinical work through to phase one and phase two studies of tolerability and uh, efficacy and safety and, and then going to randomised control trials, specifically looking at things like side effects and, and making sure that we get that right and we understand which participants, which patients are going to respond best to what kind of parameters and what their symptoms and signs tell us about them being perhaps sensitive to the treatment and maybe we need to try a different dosing method with those people. Excellent. Now, when we talk about the... But, you know, we can only do that kind of research in, in concert with clinicians so that we ask the right questions, um, so that we use the most likely effective treatment parameters and ultimately that we help our patients to take some of the burden off, off society uh, and take some of the burden off the finances of health systems and, and hospitals and health services. Because I think this kind of treatment effectively for these intractable conditions. And I think a lot of these things can be done at home without you know, the costly requirement for people to come into a clinic um, on a regular basis. Sure, they'll need to be uh, patients will need to be um, guided through and progressed depending on their symptoms and signs and they'll need to come back for checkups every so often. But I think a lot of these kinds of things will eventually, in the future, become home treatments under the supervision of people who know this. Uh, who know this. Excellent. Now, uh, when we talk about the future, you and I both have a little bit of grey hair. Do you think, do you have people in the, in, <laughs> in the stall, do you have young horses ready to roll on this? Is it something that somebody's going to pick up the mantle and, uh, and continue this along this line? Or do you have enough push now? It's just, is there going to have more shoulders to the wheel? Look, I think that's something that we, we're all looking to try and get is, is PhD students and, and research students and postdocs. I work, I've had the honour to work with a number of in colleagues and have had a number of Brazilian PhD students and postdoc students coming over to Australia to work with me. Um, so I'm hopeful, you know, from, from Brazil that we'll see a lot of this work being done. In Australia, we're finding it difficult to convince mainstream medicine of how effective this is, but we can get that. Um, and, you know, if there's anyone out there who wants to do a PhD with me or some research with me, then get in touch. I'd, I'd be happy to explore how we could do that. That's very positive. It remembers, you know, this could be, if it goes viral, you know, and uh, not a virus, but if it goes viral, maybe we'll get some funding too. And that's always good to throw money at it because it gives us the ability to do more patients and more clinical trials and then pay for the PhDs to sit there and do the work. So I have to uh, thank you again. And uh, if uh, 
anybody has uh, further questions, I'm sure they'll be able to reach out to us and 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 maybe we're going to do a uh, you know on some of the more popular talks we'll do a Facebook live and stuff like that where people can come on and uh, and ask questions and stuff like that. So uh, thanks for coming on board and sharing this with us and uh, wish you all the best. Keep it up. Thanks, Joe. Much appreciated.